Independent School District 279 School Board is called to order at 6.01 p.m. on Tuesday, September 24th, 2019. Good evening. As school board clerk, I, Heather Douglas, will be chairing this evening's meeting due to the absence of our chair and vice chair. Unfortunately, unavoidable scheduling conflicts um, made this happen. Seated in front of you this evening, from my left to your right, are Director Jackie Mosqueda Jones, Kelsey Dawson Walton, well, sorry, <laughs> I haven't done this before, <laughs> and Director Tanya Simons. And actually, to my right is um, Superintendent Corey McIntyre. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Director Mosqueda Jones, will you please lead us in the pledge? Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Board members, in front of you is the agenda. Are there any other additions or changes to the agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to accept the agenda as printed? So moved. Second. There, the second, thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes four to zero. The next agenda item is audience opportunity to address the school board. I have not received any cards for comment today, so we will go ahead and move on. Our next agenda item is the superintendent's report. All right, as a regular part of the superintendent's report, we share points of pride in our district. So um, points of pride celebrate students, staff, and community members who are contributing to the accomplishment of our mission. <clears throat> which is to inspire and prepare all students with the confidence, courage, and competence to achieve their dreams, contribute to community, and engage in, life, in a lifetime of learning. I've asked our cabinet members to share with you some recent points of pride in our district. Four students from Maple Grove Senior High have been named semifinalists in the National Merit Scholarship Program. Heather Breidenbach, Jordan Ch Chaco, Sharia Gwalakoti, and Zachary Morovich are among the highest scoring students on the 2018 PSAT National Merit Qual Scholarship Qualifying Test. They represent less than 1% of all U.S. high school seniors. Each semifinalist will now compete to receive one of more than 7,600 <coughs> scholarships. Under the category of contributing to community, um, for the past several years, students in Renee Felton's 2015-2016 third grade class at Parkbrook Elementary collaborated with Three Rivers Park District officials on the redesign of French Regional Park. After the new park opened to the community this summer, Three Rivers Park <coughs> District received an award of excellence from the Minnesota Recreation and Park Association. This award will be hung inside Parkbrook. In late August, Passion Church made a generous commitment to contribute 25000 this year towards students' negative lunch account balances in Osseo area schools. Brian Skabnik, author of a popular, of a popular <coughs> Be the Nice Kid quote, visited Fernbrook Elementary on September 6th to talk with the students about the importance of being kind and building community at the school. After hearing him speak, students then contributed to a mural on the fence overlooking the Fernbrook playground that will remind them about kindness each day. In the category of lifelong learning, a healthy tree canopy grant from Hennepin County gave students at Weaver Lake Elementary, a science, math, and technology school, the opportunity to replace <coughs> dead trees on their campus last week. The grant totaled $2,400 and covered the cost of 13 new trees that will support student learning in the years to come. As the trees mature, students will use them for phenology lessons, observe maple syrup production, and study invasive species. First Students Safety Dog Bus Tour rolled into Edinburgh Elementary on September 17th. Throughout the morning, students had the opportunity to learn about bus safety, sign a safety pledge, contribute to a thank you banner for bus drivers, and meet Safety Dog. 
The tour will visit several other states this year. In the category of mission-driven employees, Mary Pat Smith, a nurse on the Willow Lane Early Childhood Special Education Team, was named Minneapolis-St. Paul Magazine's 2019 Outstanding Nurse in Children's Health in August. Zach Blair and Emily Bollinger, two teachers from the Osseo Area Learning Center, were selected to attend the U.S. Department of State's Global Teaching Dialogue program last summer. This experience equipped them with strategies to connect their students with others around the world in order to understand global challenges and find ways to work together. You can read more Points of Pride on our website by going to district279.org. All right, thank you, cabinet members. So board members, you can see lots of evidence already uh, as our school year has started of the fact that we've had an outstanding beginning to the school year, the first three weeks. I was out that first week and got to all 30 of our sites and was just so impressed with the level of energy and the hard work of our staff to make everyone feel very welcome in our schools. Um, I could really see the, the mission, vision, and goals and our core values at play when you watch our families and students come into the beginning of the school year. And there's always some challenges on th things that are unforeseen. But uh, what I observed was our staff really being amazing problem solvers and, and helping everyone settle into that routine that we're all going through at the start of the year. So just a great, um, great start to the school year for, for our staff, our families, and, and most importantly, our students. I've also attended a number of student activities uh, the last few weeks, and I've been so impressed by the level of support for our student athletes. Uh, most recently, I was at the homecoming events at Park Center and Maple Grove Senior High Schools last week and be at, attending Osseo's events this week. And I've, whether it's been um, swim meets, volleyball, soccer, or football games, I've just seen exceptional uh, support and attendance and great school spirit um, at each of our comprehensive high schools. So I also want to just check in on my efforts to connect and build relationships with the various stakeholders in our communities and our um, supporters over the last few weeks. And I've had the privilege to, to meet and get to know a little bit better our administrators at the cities of Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove, Plymouth, and I think it's uh, Brooklyn Center this week and others on the calendar coming up. And I've also begun to meet with all of our state legislators the last uh, couple weeks and we'll finish those visits up in the, in the coming weeks. Lastly, I wanted to uh, share with our community members to the information around our efforts to engage in comprehensive facilities planning work this year. Uh, this incorporates multiple areas into one overall facilities planning process designed to determine how to best meet the needs of our district enrollment in our programs. So this fall, research teams will identify elementary and secondary school needs along with needs related to our student activities and athletic facilities. Four advisory committees will provide input and feedback to administration in their respective advisory roles, whether it's enrollment capacity, instructional programs, safety and security, or student activities. And the administration will share uh, that, that research team work and the advisory committee feedback at the school board work session in January. The board will use that information to provide direction to a district level oversight task force that will review the findings, identify funding options, and develop recommendations for consideration by, by myself as a superintendent in the, the late winter, early spring. Proposed facility recommendations will then be shared with the school board and taken out for public feedback. At that point, if revisions are needed, the recommendations will, will come back to the school board again and, and we'll work on um, revising and taking that back out for public input one more time. So we anticipate that the final facilities recommendation will be forwarded to the school board prior to the June uh, meeting schedule. And I just want to direct our community to check out the information available on our district website that's out there currently. So lastly, I just want to thank everyone for being so welcoming and supportive as I've been coming on new and school started. I've met a lot of staff. I've had a lot of requests for rides as an Uber or uh, Lyft driver. <laughs> um, and that's been very fun. So um, I appreciate that and uh, appreciate everyone's support as I become more familiar with our district. So that concludes my superintendent's report this evening. Thank you. Our next agenda item is school board reports. Jackie Mosqueda Jones, do you have any reports or updates? I was the lucky attendee at three different committee meetings last week um, at the Northwest Suburban Integration School District um, Joint Boards meeting. Uh, we looked at our enrollment and our magnet programs. Enrollment is strong in all of our magnet schools. 
We have a good start at our newest magnet school, Zanewood, as a STEAM school. And um, the Suburban Integration School District contacted families on the waiting list for Weaver to let them know um, that Zane was, Zanewood was an opportunity to also get STEM and STEAM. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's also many opportunities um, through the Northwest Suburban Integration School District uh, for staff and students to be involved in multicultural experiences and college and career ready um, focused experiences for the students. Um, the next uh, learning opportunity is um, kind of a tour around sacred sites for indigenous peoples around our area. The next meeting that I got to attend was um, CPAC, the Community Education um, Parent Advisory Council. And we started brainstorming ideas for um, bigger events that are family and parent engagement focused. And that's just at the very beginning of that uh, work. There's more work to follow. Um, we've got, we got a board update and got to see um, the welcome video uh, starring our Uber driver uh, over here, um, <laughs> Corey McIntyre. And then my last meeting last week was from Foundation um, 279. It was the first meeting of the school year, so we met some new trustees. Um, we discussed development ideas for more fundraising. And then um, the Night Out Committee is looking for volunteers to help plan a party. So if you're a, plan a party planner, um, you can contact me or Brian over there, and uh, we'll get you hooked up, okay? All right, that's it. Uh, Director Kelsey Dawson Wolfen, do you have any updates or reports? Um, I just have a couple. Um, first, I just want to, with the points of pride, I brought my girls to the park at Fernbrook, and it was so cool to see, see the Be the Nice Kid um, bench and the buddy bench and um, the, the, the fence kind of sign, and I just think it's just so awesome to see um, that. Um, <clears throat> I went to the the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance, I feel like it was a while ago now, um, meeting, and they are they finished up a study around the staff drop and roll um, initiative looking at our, um, um, Hennepin Tech and North Hennepin Community College and looking at, and it's a lot of our students coming out of our high schools into um, um, uh, community colleges and just tracking their success there. And so they're gonna be doing some presentations. Um, I was just actually pulling it up. Um, this Thursday, they're gonna be at, um, they're having a convening at 845 at Brooklyn Center High School for all of the K-12 education partners to hear the results and identify um, priority action in order to really assist those um, the students to have um, successful outcomes in education, post-secondary education. Um, and then the next thing I just wanted to mention is that um, on September 10th, I believe, we had our first listening session as a board um, at Maple Grove High School, and it was really um, well attended um, for being the first one. And our next one will be November uh, 12th at Osseo High School. Um, we're starting at 515. Is that what time? 515, and then after, we'd like everybody to join us for a listening session. This is really, or excuse me, the work session. So it's really an opportunity for um, the board to really engage with our community and really to have a conversation and, and listen to um, things that are going well, concerns, um, and just to figure out what the priorities are in our, in our community. Okay, thank you. Director Simons, do you have any updates or um, reports? Yes, so since our last uh, school board meeting, we had two ECMAC committee meetings. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar with ECMAC, it's the purpose of the ECMAC committee, which is the Enro Enrollment and Capacity Management Advisory Committee. Uh, the purpose is to analyze information affecting enrollment capacity and building use and to generate observations and recommendations to be communicated to the district administration. So in our first meeting, we had a really good onboarding session. Um, which helped to really level set everybody on the work that's been done over the past um, four or five years, um, and then to uh, go over the principles and the role of the committee. So that was an excellent grounding session. Um, they also, we also reviewed the community survey results, which we'll also hear tonight. Um, our second meeting began really the work of the committee, um, and throughout the year, the committee will be involved in analyzing different options. And so uh, one option was reviewed um, with the staff recommendation regarding the Weaver Lake Magnet School. And at one point there had been an option um, as part of our work to uh, ease capacity constraints in the district. There had been a discussion about the potential option um, 
regarding Weaver and potentially moving that magnet program. The committee reviewed the recommendation not to make that move and adjustment, and all of that information for the ECMAT committee, um, for those interested, is available on the website. So if you're interested in following um, that particular set of work, that's all public and out on the website. And so again, they reviewed that staff decision um, recommendation not to be making any adjustments um, regarding relocating that program. So that was the primary work of that evening. And we'll have um, another upcoming meeting in October, I believe. All right. Thank you. I also have some reports. I serve on DPAC, which is our district um, planning advisory council. And I'm really glad that we have such a huge turnout tonight because we actually are, we need more support at some of our schools. Um, our goal is to have equal representation on all of our community. Um, committees and uh, right now some of our schools do not have representation by um, staff or community members so if you are interested in or want to recommend to your families um, students that you work with we you can find information on our website about how to get involved with that and what DPAC does is we provide the community and staff with um, involvement in planning and evaluating existing um, instructional programs and that's really, really high level. It's, there's a lot of things that we do. So our first meeting was really an introduction to DPAC, what it's all about, and getting to know each other. And then next, our next meeting will be prioritizing where the goals are. And people who are involved in DPAC know that your voice is really um, heard loud and clear at the board level. Uh, the work that you do on DPAC comes directly to us and that's how we make changes in our district um, based on curriculum and um, things like that. So if you're interested in joining that or know someone who might be, please pass it on. And I also serve on the District 287 uh, board where we have had a number of meetings and I'll be sending some information to my fellow board members about a program called Get on the Bus where board members are invited to attend and visit some of those sites where we serve our highest needs kids. Um, and so, you know, when you think about our kids who have special needs, these are the kids who have the greatest needs, and we service them through District 287 instead of in our own district um, because their needs are so great. And we will be having another meeting in about a week. So we usually meet twice a month um, for that board. And then, Kelsey, I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up the listening session. I was going to mention that as well, and so um, please come and spread the word. We, I felt like it was a really great turnout at our last last listening session, our first listening session, I should say. And um, the feedback that we got was really helpful for us. So thank you. And with that, our first presentation will feature highlights from the 2019 community survey conducted by the Morris Leatherman Research Firm, which is represented here tonight by managing partner Peter Leatherman. At the September 10th, school board work session, Mr. Leatherman presented the survey results in full detail and responded to board member questions in the school board meetings of the district on the district website, members of the public can find all the survey questions, all the results, and an auto recording of Mr. Leatherman's presentation and subsequent discussions with board members. For tonight, we've asked Mr. Leatherman to provide an abbreviated version of the results within our regular school board Recording recorded meeting. Welcome, Mr. Leatherman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and uh, it will be abbreviated from the uh, longer work session study. Uh, just to refresh everybody's mind on what we undertook for the district, we spoke with 400 randomly selected residents across the school district as a whole. Um, the district was also interested uh, on some specific questions for parents. So within the sample of 400, approximately 35% had children. Uh, in or, so in order to have a statistically uh, a valid sample, we did a balloon sample going up to 300 where we called an additional uh, set of parents so we can look at some of those questions specifically. The interviews were conducted back in August from the 5th through the 27th. The average interview time was 22 minutes. Uh, Non-response rate, once we found them at home and uh, they weren't attending the state fair or going on last minute vacations before the start of the school year, was 5%. Uh, the statistical caveat is the overall samples projectable plus or minus 4%, the parent samples projectable plus or minus 5.5%. 
The demographics, I put this up so you can see kind of the cross-section. And part of the reason we ask a series of demographics is not only to be able to look at attitude uh, uh, variations between specific demographic groups, but to validate the sample against updated U.S. Census uh, information. Uh, the first set of bars is how long has the person lived in the school district. Uh, we had 16 percent, one in six folks that have been in the district for less than six, uh, less than five years. Uh, the newbies we call them, and you have 18 percent, almost one in five, that are the settlers that have been here for over 30 years. The average time in the district, uh, longevity comes in roughly at about 14 years on average. 19 percent indicated they had a preschool age child. 36% had a child attending the Osseo School District, and 56% were empty nesters. Now they could be older empty nesters, or they could be younger uh, or singles just without children. An empty nest isn't meant to imply an age, it's only meant to indicate the lack of presence of a child. 25% are millennials, uh, 18 to 34 year olds, 15% over the age of 65. Average age on this sample uh, was approximately 46 and a half years old. Uh, almost one in five were renters, and then for homeowners, we asked for their assessed home value. Uh, it could be also be a little bit higher as people are more hopeful in their assessed value, uh, but it comes in roughly at about 310,000 on average. A question that we've asked uh, across the state of Minnesota that we're watching very closely um, in the current economy are self-classified financially stressed versus financially comfortable. Um, you're at the average of what we saw about a year ago of the 30% saying they're stressed and 70% saying financially comfortable. That number is a very fluid number at the time as the stock market and uh, national economic issues, the, the norm on that across the state right now is 40% financially stressed. Um, so there is growing concern, uh, has it though localized to the Osseo School District. Uh, gender was uh, intentionally balanced 50-50. Uh, we do that by asking the birthday method, whose who's, uh, birthday is closest to the date we're asking, or we would have 70% women because men don't answer the phone. <laughs> Um, and then uh, the, the area of the district, 7% uh, Brooklyn Center, 35% Brooklyn Park, 47% Maple Grove, 8% Plymouth, and then the remaining areas of the district were 3% is the overall makeup. So what does the survey say? At the top, I will say that it really is, uh, there have been some um, impressive changes. Uh, I'll be talking and making comparisons across the metro area with all the clients that we work with. Um, and we always, by company, we always do a spring and a fall survey. So we're monitoring the state and the metro area as a whole looking for norms. But we have the luxury in the Osseo School District with having worked with the district going back to the 90s um, of looking at some history. And the first uh, significant change that we see historically in this district is the overall quality of education. Um, last time in 2012, the quality of education was 71% favorable to 17% unfavorable. This time, it's uh, up to 87% uh, favorable to only 10% unfavorable. But the key change is the excellent rating. Um, Minnesotans, for those that have heard me present, are, I always say are very difficult graders. Um, and they tend not to get enthusiastic about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So an excellent rating is significant. It, what, it's what we help differentiate school districts across the state. The norm excellent rating right now is 21%. You can see the district here uh, in 2019 is 48%. So almost 30 points higher than the norm, but then also going back to 2012, it's 29 points higher than historic than the historic levels we've seen. So there really is a there is a growing enthusiasm in the schools. Now, a couple of open ended questions. We haven't talked about any topics that could um, affect people's opinions. So we want to gauge up front. What do they like most about the school district? Uh, they can tell us anything, and we collapse these down into categories. And what we typically see in a school district, we kind of put these into three silos. There are folks that focus on the personnel, the teachers, and that's what leads the list in an open-ended 26%. 
Then there are folks that are looking and what they like best is what's happening in the classroom, the academics. And that actually, if we add the high quality education and good education is 29% and leads the list. The third leg of, 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 the, of the stool that folks typically look at is the curriculum and programming. And in this district, it's not as strong as we see others. This is very, these results are idiosyncratic. Some districts are very focused on programming, others on academics, others on teachers. The curriculum and program is 16%. You do have a unique result that is very um, it, it actually looks more like an outstate uh, Minnesota result, and that's parent involvement. 12% point to parent involvement of what they like most in the Osseo School District, one in eight folks. Uh, the norm on that in the suburbs is 4%. So there is a sense, a growing a, a sense out there that really people do feel a connection and a great sense of involvement. Now, if we ask what they like most, Unfortunately, we typically follow up with what's the most serious issue facing the district. And I'll say at the outset that there's nothing that we would consider to be a major issue. A major issue is something that hits 25%, where one in four people are coalescing around one response. You have uh, one issue, uh, two issues actually, that hit double digits. Class sizes at 15% and 12% concerned about the lack of discipline. Class sizes, we'll look at, um, uh, a little more in depth in the, uh, later on in the survey, uh, that varies obviously from district to district depending on growth, bond ref recent uh, bond referendums, uh, items like that. Lack of discipline tends to be right about that 10% mark. Um, it will vary depending, and, and this is one of those issues that has, uh, that crosses borders. Um, that if something happens on the south side of the cities and the schools or something, it automatically, people localize it to their district. Um, so the 12% is pretty typical. Um, the other items that come up then are all in the single digits. I would point to the bottom bar, uh, those that say nothing. There are no problems whatsoever in the Osseo School District at 17%. We call those folks boosters. Um, and they are positive throughout the, the survey. They rate the quality of education positively. Job performance is high. Financial management ratings are positive. The, that core booster set, almost one in five, the norm on that right now across the metro is about 9%. So you're about double what we typically see. Now, a validation for that excellent rating up front that we saw is when we ask folks to look at the quality of education and compare it to five years ago. Do they think it's better, about the same, or worse? What we're looking for is a ratio between better and worse. And you see we have 37% saying they believe the quality is better, 7% worse. The ratio is better than five to one. The norm on that is about two to one. Uh, saying it's moving in the right direction, a strong endorsement of, of comparisons to five years ago. And yes, there are those districts, I'll be presenting Thursday night that, uh, to another school district that have more people saying worse than better. It's kind of a troubling environment for the district. Also then, we've asked them to compare historically, how about comparing to the neighbors? Well, folks always feel better uh, about in comparison to their neighbors, it's kind of a self-fulfilling uh, sense that they want to have. So that actually goes to 41% better, 5% worse, an 8 to 1 ratio. Norm on that is about 3 to 1. Um, so both when we're comparing uh, to, to neighboring districts and history, people really do feel a strong sense that the quality of education is better uh, than it has been in the past. How about offering a wide range of educational options for students? 87% uh, rate the district favorably, only 9% rate it only fair, poor, and 4% are unsure. And once again, we have more than a third, 36% rating it as excellent. Very strong endorsement. The norm on this, the norm favorable is about 80%, the norm excellent is 25%. What about meeting students' learning needs? How does the district do in meeting all students' needs? Does it meet most students' needs? Some, very few, or very few. Um, the all students' needs being met is a very stringent um, uh, answer for folks to give. Uh, the 41%, uh, right about what we typically see in the lower 40s as a whole. Um, 
overall, you have 88% saying at least most students' learning needs are being met. Now, for those that say most, some are very few, which is 56% of the sample, we follow up and we ask, is there a certain type of student whose learning needs are not being met? And that's what is in the upper right-hand corner. So those percents reflect 50, uh, 56%. Um, and so where are fo uh, uh, people's focus and concern on? Pretty much what we see across the metro area and actually across the state. And this really has changed over, I've been doing this 25 years. In the 90s, everybody was focused, there isn't enough for gifted and talented students. Uh, Ten years ago, the focus was the average student. Districts are doing so much for the struggling, so much for gifted and talented, and the average student is being lost. The concern now is from the average down to the struggling uh, student. The, the concern for gifted and talented and the average as a whole um, isn't there, and is typically what we see across the state. So folks talked about lower income students' needs, uh, learning needs not being met. You had 16% saying average. ESL uh, at 16 and struggling at 12. Um, but overall, keep in mind, you have 88% saying that at least most students' learning needs are, not, are being met. Some district perceptions. And we're going to do some comparisons to 2012 on this. Uh, first off, does the district ask voters for a property tax increase only as a last resort? In 2012, 54% said that was the case. Now 67% say that's the case. The norm on that right now is 53%. Um, and so you're about 14 points higher than the norm. Do they trust the district to do what's right for the students? It was 77%, a statistically significant increase to 88%, and a statistically significant decrease in those saying no. Norm on that is about 83, 84%. Has the district spent past referendum funds responsibly? It was 55 point, uh, percent. It increased 14 points up to 69%. Norm on that is 52%. On those aspects of, uh, especially finance, uh, really there's a very s large reservoir of goodwill. People are trusting the school district, uh, you know, compares in comparison to what we see across uh, the metro area right now, but also historically within the district. What about a key question that's, that uh, has tripped some districts up over the past few years? is the job of involving community members, parents, and concerned citizens in decisions. Um, these four questions we didn't ask in 2012, so I'll just talk about the comparisons. 85% gave the di agreed that the district is doing a good job of involving the community. Norm on that is 75%. And it's a very narrow range. Uh, very few districts go over 80%. Um, in this climate, people have a, a difficulty differentiating between having, their, having a say and having their way. So it really is a strong endorsement of uh, the residents feeling that they have the ability to be involved. What about providing a safe and secure learning environment? 92%, right at the norm that we see. They're proud of the schools and would recommend them. 89%, norm on that is 85%. And a question, because uh, a portion of the survey is kind of planning for the future, as, co as the superintendent uh, talked about for facilities, um, is a question that the schools are a good investment, and I would support a property tax increase to protect that investment. Uh, what we're looking for here is at the core opposition. How many people disagree in concept? Uh, we haven't said if it's a bond referendum or an operating levy, if it's 50 cents or $50 a month. How many people just disagree with that statement? 19% disagreed with that statement. Uh, and all the successful bond referendums and operating levies we've worked on over the past five years, the norm disagreement at the outset was 28%. So that core opposition at the outset is, is much lower. It tells us people are willing to have a conversation about a property tax increase and aren't going to be just reacting to the property tax increase itself. What about job performance ratings compared to 2012? The school board is up 11 points from 59 to 70. The administration is up 10 points. 
Uh, the closer we get to the students, we hope there's more fondness uh, in the community, and we see that in the district. 12% uh, uh, increase amongst uh, rating of principals and teachers up eight points. Um, the, the teachers and principals, uh, a few points higher than the norm. You know, the norm on teachers, you really in Minnesota can't get more than 90% uh, favorable on anything. People will disagree about 10%, uh, just about if the sky's blue. But <laughs> on, the, on the school board and administration, um, looking at those, we always look at a ratio because it varies so much depending on uncertainty levels on uh, people willing to make an evaluation. On the school board, you can see it's 70 to 19. It's approximately three and a half to one positive to negative ratio. The norm on that right now is uh, one and a half to one, about 50 to 36. On the administration, uh, the administrations are typically viewed a little more favorably. That ratio is typically two to one. Uh, you can see that uh, in this district, it's better than four to one. So both on the, on the uh, governance side and the administration side compares favorably to what we're seeing in, uh, in the past and currently. An interesting result in this area was the perception of property taxes. The blue bars are their opinions on total property taxes, and you can see there's a statistically significant drop in those saying that they think their total property taxes are high. 61% said they were high in 2012, dropped to 53%. Now, we still would classify the district as a hostile property tax climate just because it goes over 50%, but it is a statistically significant drop. It means that people are incredibly hostile, they're just a little less hostile than they have been in the past. <laughs> Interestingly though, and we see a drop in the perception then of school taxes. Do people think their school taxes are high? The high drop from 52 to 48, the average went 36, 38. Um, and so the, what this tells us is their animus, if they have it on property taxes, isn't focused at the schools. Um, you know, we don't know if it's focused at the city, the county, other sort of taxing uh, districts uh, that, that, that could be uh, affecting their, their uh, property taxes. We just know it's not focused at the schools because if it was, their perception of school taxes would be higher than the total. Overall then rating of financial management. A very strong 62% rated favorably, only 28% rated unfavorably and 10% are unsure. The norm on that is 50%, saying that the financial management is excellent or good. And there are very few districts that actually hit double digits on excellent. You almost did, if even I suppose we could say plus or minus uh, the margin of error. So uh, the 9% excellent is uh, very impressive in and of itself. So a key question basically is, you know, where the rubber hits the road. When they consider the property ta taxes they pay and the quality of education provided, how would they rate that value? 80% rate the value positively, only 15% rate it only fair or poor. And keep in mind, you had 53% rate their taxes as high. And you had 48% rate the school taxes as high. So really, though, when you ask for that cost-benefit analysis, if they think about what they're paying and what's being provided, it's an overwhelming positive endorsement for the quality of education in the school district. Now, some questions to set a baseline looking at future referendums. This question is framed up simply as if you heard the school district was going to ask for a property tax increase, would you be for any property tax increase? Would you be against any property tax increase? Or are you persuadable? Um, at the outset, we have 52% that are persuadable. This follows the trend, though, that we see across the state and actually across the country. Um, basically, you have equal numbers on against all and for all. Um, and half the people have made up their minds without any information. They don't know if it's an operating levy or a bond referendum. They don't know how much it costs, what the funds will be used for. 21% are against any property tax increase, 24% are for any. The key we look for on this one is the difference between the for all and the against all. And you can see it's a plus three. Um, that's actually a very strong position uh, all the successful referendums over the past three years, the norm on that is a minus four. 
meaning that the district started out with 4% more in opposition to everything than in support of everything. And historically, in the past in this district, the, this district tended to start out between 8 and 12 points behind on this question. So it really is a sea change in the perception of the core support to core opposition. A, a couple questions on what they're seeing in the district. First off, over the past five years, do they think housing construction has increased or remained about the same? 65% believe that it's increased, 28% believe it's remained the same. Do they expect that housing construction to continue in the next five years? Absolutely. 75% believe that's the case, 14% say no, that's not the case. So the residents are in tune to believe that it has been happening and the expectation is that it will continue to happen. How about student enrollment then? Are they making the link that housing construction uh, will potentially increase student enrollment? 67% believe that student enrollment has increased over the past five years and 75% believe that it will continue to increase in the next five years. Um, so they've also made that link um, into uh, you know, the expectation and potentially the need for space. What about an overall evaluation of are the school district's buildings meeting the needs of educating today's children? Uh, this is an, ag uh, an agreement question and we have 82% that say yes, they do meet the needs. 14% say no, they do not. Um, if they said no, the 14%, we ask why do they feel that way? You can see 54%, and that's 54% of eight, 14%, so about 8% of the community said the buildings need more space, and about a third, about 4% of those folks said the buildings are outdated. But there is a feeling that the buildings do meet the needs of educating today's children. They don't feel it strongly, though. Um, so the perception that the buildings are in uh, dire need of updating, expansion, modernization isn't there. The key question will be, of, you know, as you plan and move forward with facilities, you know, how do you change people's, you don't need to change people's perceptions that they're failing. You need to make them feel even stronger that they are meeting the learning needs. Move them from yes to a strong yes. A key, phrase, a key phrase over the past uh, 10 years uh, in working with uh, districts on bond referendums is the discussion of flexible learning spaces. And we asked residents uh, here, do they believe, how important is classroom design to student learning? Do they believe that there's a link? And your folks absolutely believe that. Almost eight in, in, almost eight in 10, 79% say it's at least somewhat important with 41% saying it's very important. So you don't really have to make the connection that uh, classroom design impacts student learning. Moving forward though, as with almost every other school district, um, do they believe that the Osseo School District provides uh, sufficient flexible learning spaces? Yeah, 70% say they do. It's a story to tell, you have to show them what it means. Keep in mind that you have a large portion of the community that haven't been in a school district building for 30 years. Um, and so a lot of it is, is perception, not necessarily reality. Similarly, on the uh, discussion of equity between buildings, is it important that the buildings, the facilities within each building across the district are equitable from gym space to classroom space to cafeteria space? Absolutely, 74% believe that it's at least somewhat important. Do they believe that there's equity between all the buildings in the district? Yes, they do, 67%. Um, so on both the flexible learning spaces and, the, and facilities equity, there is a belief that both of them are important, um, but more education will have to go into showing um, what equity amongst facilities is and what flexible learning spaces look like. A specific issue uh, that we brought up and gave a little paragraph explaining the uh, analysis being done between gaps in athletic uh, facilities um, and extracurricular facilities and asked, do they support using taxpayers' money to improve those facilities? You can see 54% said, yes, I support using property tax dollars to 
create equity between facilities. 36% opposed, 10% want to know the exact details of it and refuse to answer, not surprisingly. Now, of the 36% that opposed, we followed up and said, okay, if you oppose the use of public funds, what about using funds raised by community members from a private source? The 36% then split 47-39. So the core opposition that's not interested in creating equitable athletic and extracurricular spaces in the district is approximately 18%. You do have a, a, a large majority that wants something, that want to make sure that there is equity between these facilities. Um, the question is public versus private. And then finally, overall communications. Uh, a strong endorsement, a rating on the communications, 86% rate the district favorably, 9% only fair or poor. And on this one, the norm is 75%. And it's also really important to link this to everything we've seen in the past um, because you do have folks saying that they really are well communicated with. And there are those districts that, um, the, let's say, familiarity breeds less than favorable results. Um, the more they know, the less they like. That's not the case. You have 10% more people grading the communications positively, um, and you see all those positive changes uh, across the board. Similarly then, how, about, how informed do they feel of board and administration decisions? Uh, very strong um, comparison to the metro area right now. Um, historically, going back to 2012, 64% said they were either uh, well-informed or somewhat well-informed. This time, 68%. Norm on that now is 55%. And tellingly, the well-informed, those that are really engaged with what, what's happening at a board and administration decision level, uh, that you have 24% saying well-informed. Norm on that is 11% right now. So once again, the more familiarity actually breeds the favorable results and the favorable feelings that folks feel in the district compared to its history and most importantly compared to the uh, metro area as a whole. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Um, well, I'd just like to say, I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> this information gathered is overwhelmingly positive with results. And, um, you know, I, my husband and I and our four kids, I mean, we're in this district for a reason because we believe in it. And we, you know, have had a great experience with the teachers and um, staff and other families. But, you know, I, I just can't help but, you know, when we t you kind of talked about the bubble samples. And um, I mentioned it in the work session, too. Um, demographically who you know who is targeted demographically I mean I see the you know obviously the um, uh, you know household income whether it's renters financially stressed men women the geographic area but when it comes to um, race when it comes to some of the socioeconomics I mean that's where I'm really interested to dive deeper into our communities that aren't as represented um, in some of the conversations. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, there, there are multiple, I mean, there's, there's really one primary way to do it. And, and other districts have done it um, specifically more in-depth targeted survey. Um, you know, in this sense, this was kind of that broad sweeping survey looking at the district from the 30,000 foot level um, because there really had been nothing done since 2012 to gauge the district on that. Um, but even, you know, use the example of the parent balloon. I didn't, you know, you saw the results of that parent balloon on some of the policy questions that we tested in the work session. Um, but as a whole, you, you didn't have a large enough cell size within that 400 sample, so then we add the balloon. Other districts have done it on race, uh, ethnicity, uh, when they're looking at some specific policies, specific perceptions in the district. So if you establish, you know, once again, what those, you know, looking at updated census information, what you would expect to find in an overall sample, and then you do that balloon sample. Like I, I mentioned earlier, we're currently doing it with the Minneapolis Park District. Um, so they can look at uh, specific ethnic, uh, ethnic groups from East African to Hmong, what have you. So uh, you can 
really add to the sampling, the questionnaire, however you want. Um, and you know, how much do you want to cut the data by that? That that we have the ability to do that. Thank you for that, because I think you know, even you know, the equity in our in our facilities, you know, having such a favorable favorable. Um, result from this isn't necessarily, and I know that, you know, we've talked about this before, but it's not necessarily what, um, as a board member, I've heard or experienced, and so um, I don't want to ever overlook and overshadow um, some real concerns um, of our community in that way, um, and I, and race has a lot to do with it. I think a lot of the socio-demographics that we aren't seeing here, um, and I, I, you know, I'd be really interested in looking a little deeper into that, to that, that piece of it. And, and we can cut the data by area, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, some of those demographics that I put up there because, yeah, absolutely. The, the key on that one, though, is you have buy-in from the community as a whole that it's important. Um, so then if there is perceived inequity, there's going to be support in the community to do something about it. You don't have the community saying that doesn't matter, which is not necessarily the case in all school districts. And so, Peter, to clarify a, a couple of those responses, so first of all, we did capture a representation um, of our racial makeup in, in our sample, but we didn't balloon it to go deeper. We, we right? did not balloon it, and we did not use that, that question. I, could t um, I looked it up for the work session, um, <coughs> and I, I, I believe that we, we did approximately 12% of the surveys in a foreign language um, in and of itself. So one and eight were done that way, but we did not. In a typical survey like this, we ask these broader demographic questions. We can add them at any time. Okay, so to clarify, we do or do not have racial representation for our district as part of our selection criteria. Not questions, but in terms of, you know, we had the representation of geographical areas. Mm -hmm. Do we feel that the survey participants' racial makeup represented our the racial makeup we, of our district? We did not track that within the survey, but in looking at all the other demographics tied with the number of, of surveys done in a non-English mm -hmm. uh, format, I feel very comfortable that they are. We just don't have the ability to say, to cut it because we didn't track that in the response. It wasn't a question that okay. was included. So the we there's um, based on the other indicators and data we believe it is, but we cannot specifically know that. We did not ask the question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Got it. And then again to clarify, this is a perception survey. It's the community's yeah. perception. It's not whether or not our facilities are or are not accurate. It's whether the, they are perceived uh, or equitable. It's, it's whether they're perceived to be. It's a perception I, survey. I always yes. I, I always yeah. tell elected officials and administrators that this is a public opinion yeah. survey. Um, and um, pub opinion doesn't necessarily match up to what they would score on a test, shall we say, mm -hmm. or lining up with the facts. Mm -hmm. It's their perceptions. Yep. So without the racial information, I'm asking you, Superintendent McIntyre, um, I just think that we need that information um, in order to, and I understand it's a perception public opinion survey, but um, I, I don't see how we can even um, take a lot of these results um, in a way that I, I you know, I feel confident um, really sharing with our community because I know it's going to be a question that's going to be asked, and, um, and so I don't know if there is an opportunity to look into that a little bit more. Well, I think we take it for what it what it is. This is an overall perception survey of our overall communities, broken down kind of based on the demographics you put in there. And as we talked about the study session, we take good news with some some caution, and we take some bad news with caution too. I, I advise you to. We have work to do. We know that, right? So this, by no means, you know, this is good information as an overall whole. Now, if the board has has the will to dig into this deeper for some specific things, we want to make sure we're using. Um, what do we need that for? What do we can use it for? This first attempt was kind of to uh, Mr. Leatherman's point. We haven't done anything since 2012, so we want to be able to do some comparisons. Mm -hmm. You've learned a lot more now as a board. So what do we want to drill down into? Um, some districts do this every year, and they tweak questions every year to get more specific information. This was a nice baseline start, and then based on these results, we'll have, have more conversation about what do we want to know more about, and this might be the one area where we 
we can do, sounds like you, we can uh, do some ballooning or some other efforts to, to drill this down. Sounds like you've absolutely. done that before. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that's something we can continue to talk about as, a, as an overall board um, based on what do we want to use this information for. We talked, this, remember at the study session, we covered a lot of topics. This was an hour long presentation at that point. So um, I'm hearing a few things that we may want to drill down in, in, into even more. And the methodology was similar to the last time, so we were able to kind of have an apples to apples comparison. Correct. So that's a yes. benefit, okay. Yep. So I guess what I'm interested in pursuing is, <clears throat> I think it's great that we have such a favorable um, perception, and I want to know from the people that don't have a favorable perception, if a certain demographic is overrepresented in that particular number. So I would be interested in um, doing balloon samples, um, on particularly in race and um, English as um, not a first language EL families. Board members, any other questions? Not a question, I just invite the public to listen to the work session in which we reviewed a deeper dive of this content and had uh, quite an extensive Q&A session um, following it. So there's a lot of rich information that the public might be interested in. Definitely. Thank you, thank you Mr. Leatherman for all thank your you. hard work and presenting welcome. this information to us, answering all of our difficult questions. And I also wanna echo that um, the results have been really wonderful and some of us found them to be surprising. Um, based on, uh, in our position as board members, we hear a lot of complaints and people don't usually come to us to say, hey, you're doing a great job or the school district's doing wonderful and we love everything. So it was um, really nice to see that overall, most of the results were positive. And um, like Corey said, we still have a lot of work to do. So we'll take this information and dig deeper where we can and uh, go from there. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. <coughs> Our next presentation is the preliminary fiscal year 2019 year-end financial reports, and we'll receive the information from Kelly Benusa, Director of Business Services. Good evening, Acting Chair Douglas, board members, and Superintendent McIntyre. Tonight, the preliminary year-end financial results for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2019 are being presented. The district is required to annually complete an independent audit and sub submit a comprehensive annual financial report by December 31st. We begin this process in August, and the results are presented to the school board by the independent audit firm of Malloy Montague, Karnowski, Radosevich and Company for final approval in November. By September or October of each year, the process provides a preliminary year-end financial report to assist in budget development for the upcoming fiscal year. Although our numbers are not final, we don't anticipate any significant changes at this time. I would like to thank the entire business services team for all of their efforts during this process. The coordinators of business services, Cindy Brown and Mike Hewler, are instrumental in making sure that this process is performed at the highest level of expectation and I'd like to recognize them for their contributions during the audit process. The school board has before them a memo along with three attached exhibits which summarize the financial results for fiscal year 2019. The first fund being discussed tonight is the general transportation fund. This fund includes the primary operations of the district in providing educational services to students from pre-kindergarten through grades 12, including our transportation activities. Exhibit two shows the general fund revenues and expenditure budget variance. The combined variance was a positive 1.93%, and this was within our budget planning benchmark of 2%. Exhibit one shows the actual results in comparison with the budgeted amounts. The general operating and transportation revenues were over budget by $3.8 million, or 1.6%. Tax collections increased $268,000 from budgeted amounts. Interest earnings increased from assumptions. There was a negative $804,000 that was attributed to general education aid as a result of 101 less 
adjusted pupil units or APUs from budgeted amounts in prior year under accrual. Adjusted pupil units are the weighted student counts by grade level. The total APUs for fiscal year 2019 were 23,025. The current year special education revenue was $1.3 million higher than anticipated based on formula calculations provided by the Minnesota Department of Education and $2.1 million higher due to the prior year under accrual for special education being adjusted after the mid-year budget revision. The proration factor of 97.6% was removed for both years, which accounts for 1.2 million of the combined variance. This was also part of the legislative session that was finalized after the mid-year revision. This is the fourth year of the new complex special education formula. We continue to work with MDE to increase our understanding regarding the complexities of these calculations. Desegregation transportation increased 129,000 from budgeted amounts. Third party billings for medical assistance increased 282,000 over the budgeted amount of 800,000 due to more collections in fiscal year 2019 than anticipated. Overall, the general tr operating transportation fund revenues had a positive 1.6% variance when comparing the budget to our actual results. <coughs> the general operating and transportation expenditures were under budget by 5.5 million or 2.3%. Salaries were under budget by 2.8 million or 1.8%. The variance is due to five main areas. First, 1.5 million for open positions and budget capacity not being fully utilized. Second, $638,000 in Title I compensatory and other grant adjustments. Third, $250,000 for severance based on our fiscal year 2019 actuary study. Fourth, $226,000 for unused substitute budget capacity. And finally, $200,000 due to one unpaid weather related closing day that occurred after our mid-year budget revisions. The variance for employee benefits can be attributed to three main areas. First, FICA, TRA, and PRA were $237,000 less than anticipated due to lower actual salaries. Second, workers' compensation was $174,000 less than projected. And third, these amounts were partially offset by employee health insurance being more than projected by $269,000. Purchase services expenditures were $1.8 million under budget. Transportation for contracted services was under budget by 103,000 due to the additional weather related closing days after the mid-year budget revisions. Utilities were under budget by 401,000 due to energy efficiency tactics. And then other purchase services were under budget by 805,000, which included tuition paid to other districts being under budget by 160,000. And the remaining variance was due to cost containment by management and staff. Repairs were under budget by 221,000 and staff the development was under budget by 172,000. Supplies, capital, and other expenditures were under budget by 713,000. General instructional supplies were under budget by 458,000 and can be attributed to cost containment efforts of management and staff. Dues were under budget by 379,000 due to the source well technology, which was previously ties, conversion costs being less than anticipated. Overall, a pos positive variance of 2.3% was achieved when comparing our actual expenditures with those budgeted amounts. Exhibit two shows the fiscal year 2019 general transportation fund financial summary. The district's planning benchmark is that actual revenues and expenditures will be within 2% of our budgeted totals. The district's size of operations is 484 million when combining our revenue and expenditure budgets and the district's procedures are to analyze revenues and expenditures, budgets, and to revise those adopted budgets to match available estimates. For fiscal year 2019, the net revenue expenditure variance was 9.3 million, or 1.93%. This was within our planning benchmark parameters of 2%. In comparing OSSEO's financial benchmark to others, OSSEO's percent is similar, with the others range being from 2 to 4%. Exhibit three is the fiscal year 2019 fund balance summary for all funds. 
Overall, the fund balances for all funds, as shown at the bottom of Exhibit 3, increased from the prior year amount of $129.1 million to $151 million on June 30th, for a combined increase of $21.5 million. The General Transportation Fund in blue increased fund balance by $5.2 million. The Capital Expenditure Land Proceeds Fund in yellow decreased fund balance by $1.2 million. The entire Capital Expenditure Land Proceeds Fund balance of almost $9 million is restricted by state statute for facilities, equipment, textbooks, technology, and other long-term facilities maintenance. The Food and Nutrition Service Fund in purple increased fund balance to $5.1 million, or 41.7% of annual expenditures, and is more than sufficient. We will continue utilizing these resources to increase efficiency and effectiveness of operations through future capital improvements. The Community Service Fund in green increased fund balance to $3 million, or 15.2% of expenditures. Under state law, all revenue and fund balance in this fund is reserved for community education programs. The Building Construction Fund balance increased by $25.6 million. This increase was due to the issuance of $43.3 million of 2018B General Obligation Facilities Maintenance Bonds and the plan spend down in accordance with our long-term facilities maintenance plan. Debt service fund balance decreased by $10.7 million. The revenue increase includes the proceeds from the 2018C General Obligation Alternative Facilities Refunding Bonds of $8.4 million and the 2018D General Obligation Taxable Other Post-Employment Benefits Refunding Bonds of $7.7 million. The debt service fund revenue and expenditures represent amounts necessary to meet principal and interest payment schedules associated with the long-term debt of the district. So in summary, the year end results are better than anticipated due to the continued efforts of both staff and administration during the past year. These results will now be incorporated into our regular long-range financial planning process as designed. As usual, the board will be providing direction and taking action in three different fiscal years over the next several months. All of this action will be impacted by the positive year-end results from fiscal year 2019. First, on November 5th, we're going to continue the formal fiscal year 2021 budget planning process at the board's work session. These year-end results will have been incorporated into the beginning part of that process. Second, the auditors will present the fiscal year 2019 <coughs> audit report at the November 19th school board meeting. And then finally, these results will be incorporated into the fiscal year 2020 mid-year budget update brought forward for approval at the February school board meeting. Thank you, Kelly. Board members, any questions or comments? Okay, I just wanted to say thank you, Kelly, and to your team as well for all the hard work that you've put into the budget planning process and giving us accurate information, um, timely and also really good results. And thank you to all the other staff who in your respective departments contribute to um, the budget planning process and um, these excellent results. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next agenda item is the consent agenda. Board members, are there any items that you would like to remove for separate consideration? Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as printed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, motion by Director Simons, seconded by Director Dawson Walton to approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes four to zero. Action items. The first action item on tonight's agenda is the initial certification of the preliminary tax levy payable in 2020 for fiscal year 2021. Ron Meyer, Executive Director of Finance and Operations, will provide the information. All right. Good evening, Acting Chair Douglas, Superintendent McIntyre, members of the school board. Before you this evening is an action item, our 2019 pay 2020 prelim preliminary tax levy. 
So uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, the state statute requires that the school board certify the preliminary levy limitation by September <coughs> 30th of each year. The purpose of this approval is to provide information to our Hennepin County auditor so that the proposed tax statements can be prepared and mailed to all taxpayers by November 24th. The final uh, levy certification will take place at the December 17th school board meeting after the truth and taxation hearing, giving the school board an opportunity to review the levy before its final approval and certification. The legislature has authorized Minnesota school districts to levy and collect property taxes for specific elements of school funding. About 60% of dollars that are levied are authorized through voter approval. The remainder of the line items in the levy are authorized by state statute as the mechanism to provide specific funding for student programs or operational costs. This is a unique time of the year as the business services staff are working across three different fiscal years. Uh, right now, we are com uh, completing the closeout and audit of last year, you, as you just uh, heard Kelly Benusa talk about. And we are now deploying the current years, or the 1920 uh, school budget. And then tonight, our preliminary levy is really the first funding event for next year, the 2020-2021 budget. So tonight, we will discuss the preliminary levy for taxes payable in 2020 which provides the basis for the property tax revenue for the 2020-2021 budget. This slide replicates the information which is included on Exhibit A in your board materials. It summarizes the total levy and the change from last year by fund. The total proposed increase in the levy is currently calculated at just over $1.28 million or approximately 1.29%. I will now review the details of the line item changes to this year's levy. Uh, first of all, a couple of uh, items to talk about. The local property tax levy is used by school districts to secure funding for those programs for which property taxes are the mechanism made available through state law. The majority of other school district funding, as you know, comes from the state or through federal aid. Other than through specific voter approval, there are four major ways that the local levy may change each year. The first is through changes in state law through the legislature. The second way that a levy may change is through uh, our pupil unit or specific population changes. So as our student enrollment goes up and down, so too will our levy. Um, changing market value and tax capacity of district property is another important factor for levies. Uh, some levies are equalized, which means that a portion of the funding formula is paid through state aid, a combination through levy and state aid, and the remainder is paid through that local levy. As our market value grows throughout the district, these types of levies are designed to decrease the proportion of levies picked up by state aid and increase the proportion picked up by our local levy. The final way that levies sometimes could change is when expenditures change for those programs whose revenue is based on the actual expenditures. An example of this would be our pay-as-you-go LTFM or long-term facility maintenance uh, program and levy. This slide summarizes the information included in Exhibit <coughs> C of your board materials. Again, as you can see at the top, our pr uh, total preliminary tax levy is increasing by 1.29%. The second line down, you'll see our total net tax capacity is growing by 7.17%. This is favorable news for our community taxpayers in that the levy will be spread out over a larger property value in our district, which actually reduces the impact on levy increases that we may have here uh, in the school district as well as other government entities that levy. The next four slides that I'll be going over uh, cover several line items of the general fund levy. This data is also included in Exhibit B of your board materials. The first column of numbers uh, on these uh, columns or on these slides represent the proposed paid 2020 levy for each category. You can then see a comparative dollar amount from last year's levy and the dollar amount and percentage of change from year to year. 
The single largest line item change is the voter approved operating referendum. Several factors influence this particular levy. The formula is calculated based upon pupil unit numbers, which have been consistently growing uh, from for the last several years. This voter approved formula also includes an inflationary factor, which for this year is calculated at 1.85%. You will notice in this particular line item, the difference between 2020 and last year is a significant decrease. And this, as we talked about in our work session, is due to legislative changes that has taken $300 of our voter approved uh, referendum amount and moved it to our local optional revenue, which is the next column down. You'll see that this particular levy, the local, local optional revenue has increase significantly again and that's attributed to that $300 per student that's moved from the referendum to that local optional revenue. Our capital projects levy or our what's commonly referred to as our tech levy um, will increase as our tax capacity rises. So as you recall our tax capacity net tax capacity is increased in 7.17%. This voter approved levy is calculated as a percentage of that tax capacity. So as our total tax capacity of the school district increases, so does the dollar amount generated through this particular levy. The operating capital levy is increasing because it's linked to our building age and to the number of students. So again, as our enrollment continues to increase, our operating capital um, increases as well. This slide covers the next several lines of the general fund levy. Uh, one item that I do want to highlight on this particular um, slide is our alternative teacher compensation. This levy is tied to student numbers and because so many districts are now participating and this is the second year uh, that this is the case, state aid is actually prorated. Um, so that more of the funding for this particular pro program actually comes through our levy because the state um, prorates their amount that they contribute. This slide covers the last several lines of the general fund levy. Uh, a couple that I want to point out, the long-term facility maintenance um, line item. Uh, again, this is the pay-as-you-go portion of LTFM. So we have the pay-as-you-go and then we have uh, the bonds, the debt service portion of LTFM. Again, this is based on our 10-year deferred maintenance plan and the projects that we fund through that. Um, you will see in this line item that it's decreasing in the pay as you go. Um, again, this plan is set up so that it tries to keep that levy amount uh, stable from one year to the next. And so you'll see an increase actually in the debt service based on the bonds that we sold last October uh, for LTFM. So that's why the pay as you go portion is decreasing. The other point that I want to uh, highlight is the retiree health benefits. You'll see the line right above LTFM. Uh, this year, we don't have a levy in, the, in that amount. And for the last several years, we have levied for $600,000 uh, for our OPEB, or our post-employment benefits uh, portion. We are now, according to our latest actuarial study, fully funded, so the state no longer allows us to levy for that amount. So that is a decrease in our levy. The next slide that I want to highlight is our building leases. And there's two points that I want to make on this particular slide. Um, again, based on the conversation that we had at the September 10th work session, this levy includes the principal and interest payments for $15 million of bond costs for potential funding mechanism to address overcapacity conditions at our school buildings. Based on the work of our enrollment, and Capacity Management Advisory Committee and the Integrated Facilities Planning Process that's been established. This is the same process that we used last year in designating these dollars through our levy process to give us flexibility in our planning process for facilities. You will also notice in the, um, in the general adjustment, other general adjustment category, that there's a negative adjustment and this is because we did not use those funds we levied for last year so those are going back to the taxpayers in the form of a negative adjustment. Second item that I want to um, point out in this particular category is that we did have a decrease of around $270,000 in our building leases, specifically because Intermediate District 287 has started to require our non-member districts to, who utilize our services to also pay a proportionate share of lease levy. 
And so as a result, the member districts of 287, each of their lease levy requirements have decreased. Ours is around $270,000. So in total, our general fund levy is actually decreasing uh, by just over $1.5 million or 2%. Shifting to our community service funds, you'll see on the bottom, community service fund is in increasing slightly by about 2.5%. Uh, 72822 the bulk of this increase is through our prior year adjustments as well as our abatements that came through. Debt service funds, you'll see that this is uh, increasing by about 13.4%. As a reminder, we're required by state statute to levy for 105% of our expected principal and interest payments on the debt that we hold. Over time, our fund balance increases in this fund and we receive a negative adjustment, essentially giving that 5% back um, through a negative adjustment. So you'll see on this uh, slide and the reduction for debt excess that it's going down, uh, or that it increased about $1.2 million from uh, <coughs> prior year. Still had a negative adjustment, just not as large of a negative adjustment, adjustment as the year before. So the end result is an increase of about 13.4% or $2.7 million in our debt service fund. So tonight, we recommend that the school board approve the 2019 payable 2020 levy certification at the maximum. This is advised because it provides maximum flexibility <coughs> to the school board to make adjustments to the levy before final certification in December. And it also allows staff to continue to work with the Minnesota Department of Education to finalize data through September 30th. I can tell you that even today, about 2.30, they ran another levy. We're still waiting for some things to come through, so it's possible that some things may change as we move forward. We've tried to anticipate what some of those changes are gonna be to bring you the most up-to-date information. But again, some of those things could change up until September 30th, and that's why we're asking for uh, approval at the maximum tonight. As far as our next steps, uh, shows on here that we will be back in front of the board specifically to talk about levy on December 17th with our truth and taxation hearing opportunity for the public to give feedback and then an opportunity for the board to take action at that point. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Ron. Board members, any questions? Uh, Mr. Meyer, I have one question. Um, I missed <clears throat> when you um, told us the $300 per student went from um, the referendum to the local optional um, yep. revenue. Was that per student or per pupil unit? It's per pupil unit. Okay, yep. thank you. <coughs> okay, is there a motion to approve the initial certification of preliminary tax levy payable in 2020 for fiscal year 2021? So moved. moved. Uh, so moved by Jackie Miskata Jones. Is there a second? Second. Second by Director Tanya Simons. Is there any discussion? So um, I know this is extraordinarily complex and takes a lot of time and effort. <coughs> and as you said, um, because we get a lot of the information from the state, um, that it can still change. So um, just thanks again for your team and working through this. And um, it's over the past year, it's been a great learning experience to understand in detail all of the technicalities of um, the levy formulas and how much direction um, uh, and outcome of what we need to levy is really through state law. So um, it's very different, just in kind of making my comments for the public as well to understand it's very different than our other um, taxing entities um, like the city um, perhaps. So, um, so if there's, you know, this is one of those things that the public can listen to, go back, listen to again, and kind of really understand the line by line um, to understand kind of how we arrive at that um, nearly 2% um, max. And, and to your point, things can still change. So I'm happy for our taxpayers that it's um, quite low uh, this year. Um, and uh, we don't have anything new in terms of what we're asking for. Really, it's pretty straightforward, though it is quite complex. So thanks for the team for all the work you put into it. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes four to zero. Our final action item is the recommendation to accept gifts, gifts to the district totaling 91,000, no. 
Yeah, $91,085.48. Is there a motion to accept gifts from the district totaling $91,085.48? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Director Dawson Walton and seconded by Director Mosqueda Jones. Is there any discussion? Thank you. Huge thank you to our community and all the donors. Um, we appreciate all of it. And um, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes four to zero. And our very last agenda item is adjournment. Do we have a motion? <coughs> so moved. Do we have a second? Second. Motion by Director Dawson Walton, seconded by Director Simons. All in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes four to zero. This meeting is adjourned at 7.26 p.m.